All right. Ryan, my first question for you is what's the last book you read? Because we know you're a ferocious reader and you're in your little library. So it just makes sense to go right there. Um, the last one, I just finished it. I just finished it this morning. It's called Bounce by Matthew Said, S Y E D. Thought it was really good. I gave it a good uh, review. It's a bit hard to give it a rev uh, like a, it's a bit hard to communicate how good it was because there are other excellent books in the science of success category. That's what it's about, mm -hmm. uh, especially Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell and Mastery by Robert Greene, among many others. But like those two are standout, excellent books. So this one kind of is in the shadow. It's definitely in the shadow. It was written after it references Outliers, but uh, it focused on sports science. The author is an athlete himself, a uh, table tennis Olympian. Okay. So uh, I think sports was a really good uh, way to dismantle the genetic hypothesis of uh, success, right? People think that, that talent is innate. You must have been born with it. You must have been born with that interest or that talent, or maybe it's in the genes. Uh, and the book did a great job of dismantling it. And actually, one minute right before I jumped on here, uh, I read a comment on my review on Instagram. And the comment was, oh, you had me until sports. He said, that, and the rest of the comment was something about not liking sports. I'm not into sports either, but I think uh, it was really good to focus on sports because intellectual achievement or academic achievement or uh, professional achievement or business achievement, money achievement, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. It's a little bit arbitrary. It's a, a lot of it's subjective. Yeah. Who is the greatest artist of all time, right? Who is the greatest mm -hmm. musician of all time? Whereas sports are objective. You know, right. fastest person of all time, you know, top chess player. Yeah. They have, you know, very easy ranking systems to understand. So uh, there's no ambiguity involved. Uh, where a lot of the other examples, especially in Gladwell and Green's work, uh, you're, you're talking about individuals who might have made political success or business success or something like that. And again, you can argue over how much of it was their innate talent and how much of it um, was genetic or environmental or, or whatever. Mm. Uh, and I know we're usually we usually talk about health here, but uh, I think this is important, you know, just in life in general. You know, we need to know that success is a product of hard work and uh, from other subjects too. even relationships are a product of good work. You know, uh, good relationships are a product of hard work and all this all this stuff. So if people think oh, I'm just innately I'm not good with people. You know, uh, oh, I could never do that. I could never learn that, you know, sales. Oh, I'm not yeah. that type of person. There's no such thing as that type of person, basically. No. You know, you as long as you meet the minimum, like, physical requirement for even something like basketball, you know, your minimum height requirement or whatever, then the rest of it is a product of work. And all of us, all of us that are, you know, able to even understand the recording like this, we're completely capable of conquering the world, basically, you know, with enough uh, focused attention and enough hours built into it we can do it sure it goes for learning, learning this health stuff too i know? mean how how much are you how much do you read i really only like reading in the morning uh, that's like my optimal and i'll tell you my life is a little bit weird because i live in two places right. now you know i spend half my time in texas and half my time here so when i'm here in my house and uh where i'm mostly alone all the time <clears throat> most of the time I have everything to occupy me. Basically, I can paint, I can use my computer in peace and quiet. You know, I can make videos, I can, I can do numerous things, I can write a book, I can, you know, right now I'm working on transcribing, because uh, we're re releasing diseases of exotic animals, uh, Dr. Wallach's disease of exotic animals. Yeah, huge project. And those are the things that I can dedicate my my whole day to It's a monster you know, book. business housekeeping. But in Texas, I read a lot more roundabout roundabout uh answer to your question in texas i can uh, this summer july august they were very very busy business months but i still read i think 30 books 30 books in 60 days so all right so how many lot. how many books do you read a year roughly now i usually don't like this question dr reese because <laughs> it's hard to compare books right for example i could just pull off a couple of small books here yeah, there's different sizes. You know, here's here's two very very small books yeah. that I think are great books. I just I just picked them off somewhat randomly. 
two very, very small books, The Peter Principle by Lawrence Peter. Amazing. This is on my mandate. These are both on my mandatory reading list, actually, on my website, noticebooks.org slash reviews. Right. Uh, yeah, so tiny books. So would I count these? I just, I don't like adding them up like that. I don't think of it like that. I just try and put the time in consistently. And I know it's going to add up. Some books are smaller than others, but you can't measure the value of a book based on how many books you read. You know, not only can small books be really, 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 really important. Like some of my all time, many of my all time favorite books are small. Yeah, they're probably average way down to the small side. Not only that, but if you really get benefit from a book, it's to me, rereading it is the real value. So if people get caught up in in numbers. Yeah, I got to read 50 books a year. Well, hopefully you're stopping when you find something incredible and you reread it. Maybe not back to back, but some of them, yeah, read them back to back. You know, so you see what I'm saying? People can be caught up in like, oh, I got to I got to do something new. You know, I got to keep I got to read this right. certain amount of books. It's not about the the quantity as much as it is the quality. And definitely some small books can hit you super, super hard. Yeah. And if, you're just, if you're just counting books, you might not take the time. You might just quickly read through it. Right. OK, I finished another book. Right. I have to step back a little bit because I do uh, reviews on Instagram. Right. I have to make sure that I'm properly reading things, sure. internalizing it. And if it is really good and really important, I have to reread it. I don't care if I've reviewed it before. Then if you're not getting a review this week, I got to reread this book because it's really, really important. So yeah, I'm, I'm it's very... a bit of a skill, but it's, it's probably a lot. I don't know. I've never counted it. Some years where I had nothing to do before this business and everything, I was a nobody, you know, and I didn't have a business. And if any time that I didn't know what to do in life, I just read a ton. Talk yeah. about all day. What else are you gonna do, right? Yeah. Especially if you're poor, like I was. I don't have cable. I don't have a TV. A lot of times, not all, not all the time, but sometimes I didn't have internet at all. Like I just lived in a place of no internet at all. What are you gonna do to waste your time? You know, I don't want to waste my time. If I don't know what to do, I, maybe a book will give me an idea. At least I finished a book. Mm-hmm. But during those years, that was when, you know, I, I read tons, like over a thousand in the in a few years, probably. Wow. Uh, but it's a product of boredom. It's not necessarily a trophy, right? But now that I'm busy, yeah, I don't like reading that much. I like to read an hour a day and, and spend the rest of the day doing stuff. And that hour a day, it still adds up. This month, I, I won book right. seven, you know, and I'm wow. not just an hour a day, yeah. no, nothing else. Right yeah, in the I'm, morning, I'm very inspired by short books. And that's why when I wrote Peace Over Pain, I, I wanted to make sure it was under 200 pages. It ended up being 130 pages. And I was just like, yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. I love the size of it too, by the way. Thank you. Really great. It's not an attention span thing either, by the way. Some people say, oh yeah, we got short books these days um, because of shortest attention spans. No, you just don't need to waste that much time. No. To communicate this, you don't need to spend that much time. You don't need the details. On, On Audible, it's three hours. But that's not the important part. By the time someone's interested in the details, they've got the message. So your book delivers the message very, very efficiently. And it's only and three. It's, it's, only, it's only three hours on Audible. You know, it's like a it's class. Not a new thing either. This book is from like the seventies. I think it's a it's a tiny book. I can, I can hold it yeah. with one hand. You know, it's a, been writing small books for a long time. They used to be called pamphlets or essays. Yeah. Yep. So changing gears a little bit. Last week. I had on this very Zoom, I interviewed Elaine LaLanne, 96 years old. She's the wife of the great Jack LaLanne. You remember Jack LaLanne? Jack LaLanne, the juice guy. In his his senior years, he was the juice guy. Yeah. But he he was the first one uh, to have a gym in the United States of America in the 1930s. And he was promoting nutrition, fitness, and mindfulness in a way. And he became famous and they put him on TV. So he was the first health influencer because he was on black and white TV, getting people to work out and eat good. And he had supplements. He had his own protein drink and he had, you know, he used to tell people to supplement, but the moral of my story is that 
Elaine, who was fun, you know, 96 years old. I always love talking to these, these older folks, especially when they got that zip, you know? And she says, Jack was promoting supplements because there, he believed that there wasn't enough nutrition in the food. And I was like, ah, oh, that's exact. That, that speaks to exactly what we talk about. Except he was talking about it in the 1940s and 1950s. And so this was a, just a major uh, uh, corroboration you know, having someone like Jack um, to, to find out that that's what his that's what his feeling was back then. So you can only imagine how worse the fields are now compared to 70 years ago. Wow. <laughs> so we, we need our supplements, man. We need that 90 essential nutrients plus some in most cases. And you know, I remember seeing an interview with Jack Lane in his older years as the old man, Jack. And they always ask a health guru what you eat. I get it all the time. Every time I'm interviewed. So what do you eat? It's constant. And so they asked Jack that. And he says, well, I don't eat junk and I take supplements. Everything from A to Z, he says. <laughs> so it was a nice... It was, it was a nice dialogue, you know, and, and to, you know, to come across this and uh, it sort of overlaps with Dr. Wallach's work, you know, and Jack's a little older, but. Um, I'm pretty sure Doc uh, made uh, two CDs with him as well. I'm pretty sure it was him. Might have been somebody else, but I think it was him. Juice, okay. Juice Cures and the History of Juicing. Okay. Oh, man, that would be cool to find that footage. It's uh, it's on our Wallace Warriors YouTube. It, well, those two CDs are there. I'm not sure if it's him, just off the top of my head, but it might be. Okay, there was a few juice juice guys. There was uh, Jay Cordish. You know what? I think it was Jay Cordish. I think yeah. it was Jay Cordish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was known as the juice guy. Jack Lane was known as the fitness guy. Okay. And it's a little bit before my time here, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before my time, too. Well, man. Time. I'm 10 yeah. years older than you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm happy to to have that um have that clip because it's it's just so important. And I, I keep drilling this point home to whoever will listen, you know. You know, there's the, the minerals aren't there. Why would you say that someone should take R? plant-derived minerals from longevity. Well, step back a minute. You know, in primary school, I remember learning about the water table. I don't know why anyone didn't give us those same diagrams, more or less same diagrams about the mineral cycle. You know, minerals are in the soil. Plants grow them. They take them with them. That's why you have magnesium and iron in your broccoli because it took it out of the ground and you, you took the broccoli away, you put it on a truck and you ate it for dinner. It's gone. You know, where did it go? It, okay. It goes into the sewers. Are we putting the sewers back on the fields? No. Okay. So where is this coming from? Right. So minerals are not distributed evenly around the earth. We should have been taught this. We were taught the periodic table, but we weren't really taught what it means. Yeah. And uh, where to find these things and what abundance they're in and what kind of clumps or compounds we normally find them in. You know, the, the people don't understand chemistry this way. And if they think fertilizer is putting anything useful back onto the soil, they're right, but it's not minerals. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And yeah, I'm going to answer the question of, of why they should use ours. I mean, but like, we got to understand uh, what we're even doing here in the first place. First of all, you can't patent a mineral. So there was never a commercial incentive really to have a fertilizer that's based on minerals. Not only can you not patent those individual minerals, it's very heavy. You can't transport them effectively, efficiently, right? What's much more uh, efficient and effective uh, liquid, right? And what can you make in liquid? Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. In fact, nitrogen, a nitrogen compound called urea, which is named because it's found in urine, 
It was the first uh, chemical ever synthesized. Uh, not not the first um, uh, health uh, or or sorry, it was the first organic compound ever chemically synthesized. It wasn't meant to be a fertilizer. It was just the first achievement. It was a nitrogen compound. So that's much easier to transport nitrogen, a nitrogen-based formula around than it is minerals. And nitrogen is required for growth. So is potassium and phosphorus. So, you know, we think we've got that covered because that covers basic growth, but it doesn't cover the other metrics of the uh, health of the plant. We're not even talking about people yet. And we don't take these things into consideration, by the way. The only thing that agricultural science takes into consideration is its end product, which is bushels per acre, right? How much crop can you actually get per space of land, per plot of land? So bushels per acre is what matters. Nitrogen, nitrogen phosphorus, and potassium gives you the maximum benefit for the lowest dollar. It doesn't achieve maximum growth, but it achieves really good growth for very little money. And so it's been the industry standard. But again, we're not measuring anything other than bushels per acre when it comes to strawberries or, or corn or wheat or anything like that. So we're not taking into consideration uh, the proteins those plants might be making, such as the wheat proteins. And we're also not taking into consideration the nutrient content of that food. We, we, the USDA publishes it every year, by the way. We know soil values of every essential nutrient, at least the ones that the mainstream agrees on, uh, such as uh, copper and iron, zinc. You know, I mean, we know all those ones are going down. Uh, so that's, that's no secret at all. But um, we also can measure this based on the BRICS score as well. BRICS score is a measure of the sugar content that the fruit or the berry or even the vegetable produces, B-R-I-X. And this is something we just, why didn't we, why weren't we taught this in, in elementary school? Because we should understand that bushels per acre is not a good metric of whether your agricultural uh, production is successful or not. Mm. Bushels per acre matters. You need to grow something, but are we growing healthy plants? You know, are we, are we growing plants with a high nutrient content? For it right. to have a high brick score, it also has, a high, has to have a high nutrient content. So it does have more of the plant sugars, but it's also got more nutrients in it. A healthy plant can pull more minerals from the soil, right? So it's not just uh, the minerals that are being depleted. It's also the vitamin content. This was, we, we were getting to this. You know, the minerals are what's in the soil. Plant sucks them up. It does need several of them for its own growth metabolism. And uh, we'll make do with less. It just won't, won't grow as amazingly. The, the leaves won't be as green, right? If it doesn't have enough magnesium in the soil, they'll still grow leaves. It just won't be that green. Plant will try its, its hardest. But a healthy plant produces vitamins, amino acids, essential fatty acids, antioxidants. You know, it produces actually hundreds and thousands of plant compounds that we don't even fully describe. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the 90 essential nutrients, it's a catchphrase. It's really not the 90 essential nutrients. If you read the list, it adds up to 91 because we consider it omega-9 essential, even though it's technically not. Right. And uh, some of those vitamins are actually phytonutrients. They're, they're groups of phytonutrients. Flavanols, flavanols, or bioflavanols. We've probably heard of these if we're looking at antioxidants or, at all. Yeah. But these are massive groups of nutrients that we don't have fully cataloged and we don't fully understand. And yet plants pr produce all these things when they're healthy. When they don't have enough minerals, they produce less of them. Again, we could measure that. We could take a rough measure of it with the BRICS score. We could do more advanced chemical analysis, which the USDA already does. Um, you know, it's, Again, it does it regularly. We've been doing it well over 100 years. We have that data. You're talking about the 1940s. You can go back even further than that to the 20s. We knew that nutrient deficiencies in soils were a problem back, I believe it was the 20s when we started adding iodine into food. It was the very first mass supplementation, mass fortification in America. Got rid of graders. Well, people who were eating processed food had iodine deficiency, period. Yeah. Uh, enough where they wanted to put it, uh, they wanted to give it to everybody, right? So we've known this is a, a massive problem. Why should they take our minerals? Well, Dr. Wallach was a farmer and uh, he might be comfortable financially, but he's still definitely cheap like a farm boy. And I was poor for most of my life. So I gravitated towards the economical, uh, the sense of, sen the one that made economical sense the economical option. And so did Dr. Wallach, right? What are we going to do? we got this problem out here. What do I want to pay the most that I could possibly pay for it, aka like CMOS, right? Um, or do I, I want to try and find a source that has all the minerals in it, which is readily available. This information on, on soil chemistry and 
if you find a deposit of something such as humic shale, like we did, mm-hmm. you can have that analyzed and you can see what's in it. And you can see how much is this going to cost to harvest this versus grow the sea moss and then desiccate it and then transport it. Uh, so it's just the cheapest, the cheapest way to get all of the 60 minerals. Uh, let me explain this further because you might think I have like some like, you should take our minerals because they're the best minerals in the world. Well, it's not the fact that they're the best, and I'll explain that. It's the fact that they're the cheapest for what you need. And what you need is colloidal minerals, right? The whole thing about the farm fields, we're not eating the dirt in the farm field, right? The dirt has minerals in it, and it's also got organic compounds such as nitrogen, right? Nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, if those four and a few others, like those are the basic building blocks of everything we know, right? The basic building blocks of a human being, of a plank of wood or of a plant, the, it's oxygen, nitrogen, you know, hydrogen and carbon, really. It's, it doesn't get uh, that much more complicated than that. But we're not eating the soil. The plants take the minerals that are in the soil and they turn them into organic nutrients, both the vitamins that they make, this is the start of the food chain, right? Vitamins, plants can make vitamins, so can some animals, right? And uh, vitamins can accumulate in animal tissues because they eat plants, but it's the plants that are making the vitamins. They're making organic compounds for us to consume. Right. Vitamins, amino acids, and essential fatty acids are chains. These, again, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, it's the, the main building points of these chain molecules, chain organic molecules. So plant makes those, but the plant also delivers plant derived minerals. It's a different form of mineral. It's called colloidal. Some people use the words ionic or fulvic. Uh, those are the two most, most common, or they might say organic, say organic minerals, but people can misuse the term organic minerals. So you really want to know what you're looking at. We're looking at a colloidal mineral. That's the technical word. That's right. the, uh, that's the official word for what we're talking about now. Colloidal solution is a solution that remains in solution let me explain if you take a clump of dirt farm field dirt or sand or any dirt kitty litter you know put it in a glass of water and shake it up it will become cloudy it will become mixed it will be called a solution but it's going to settle down if you leave it and even the salt most of a lot of it's going to separate out it's going to settle down and it's going to stay there So it doesn't remain in solution. Therefore, it's not a colloidal solution. So plant dried minerals remain in solution. And I keep saying that, but this is it's very, very important to understand a non-organic mineral, a mineral that doesn't have a charge, a mineral that may be part of a rock still, even a very tiny little rock. You break up rocks into dust. It's still a rock and it's not one mineral. You don't see one piece of iron, right? Rock is clumps of iron, nickel, cobalt, you, know, you name it, you know, it's, it's all clumped together, stuck together. We don't digest that, right? right. Or we, we don't digest that efficiently. That's why normal supplements are poorly absorbed. Mm. And the industry knows this. This is not us saying, hey, you got to buy our stuff because uh, regular supplements suck. No, the industry knows actually that minerals are not absorbed very efficiently, especially some very important minerals uh, like calcium and iron very very difficult for our bodies to absorb them so what do they do they chelate them if you go to your grocery store or your pharmacy and you go to the the supplement section you read the label none of them say just calcium calcium is an element but it's stuck to a compound not a rock but it's stuck to something Mm -hmm. gluconate citrate carbonate there's another word there right that's the chelation agent spelled with a ch but it's spelled it's pronounced key like keys chelated and chelating a mineral is to trick our body into absorbing more because we know our body poorly absorbs calcium irons and so on so they basically tumble them around in a big batch of uh, sugars or amino acids so that these other organic compounds coat the mineral and again it tricks our body into absorbing it but we still don't absorb very much of it so that's not how we're supposed to get minerals. We're supposed to get minerals that are in a different form, that are smaller, mm-hmm. right? Remember the iron and the nickel and the cobalt, and that's all clumped together when we see it in, in rocks in inorganic form or in stuck to silica, sand. You know, it's, a, it's part of some other molecule, part of some other compound. Well, the plant changes all that. 
the plants and the fungus that are in the soil together, they literally rip elements apart. They, or they don't break the element like an atomic bomb. They rip elements off of their compounds, right? They break up rocks and they pull out the individual. And this is like magic, by the way. This is like a, a, a description of something that we really, really, truly can never actually see with our own eyes. It happens yeah. to such microscopic yeah. uh, sizes that even with an electron microscope, we can just barely see this exchange happening. But what it's doing, it's pulling rocks and soil and dirt, and sand, it's pulling all that stuff apart. And it's harvesting basically the individual elements. So these tiny little pieces, these little elements go floating into the plant tissues and they're now forever changed. Mm. They're called colloidal minerals at that point. They're tiny. Like we're talking nano here and some of them, some of them are pico. There's some little nano sized particles and people use this as a sales pitch for other products, right? Nootropics, they're, they're nano size. You know, they're, they're TRS, these nano sized particles <laughs> come and detox you, right? Well, these are nano sized and this is what plants do, right? They create nanoparticles and pico particles, which is smaller than a nano. Uh, so these, these tiny little particles and they have an electrical charge. Both of those properties are extremely important. A small particle is easily absorbed in the body. The body does a lot of work to pull food apart into smaller and smaller pieces into its base constituent components so that we can use those components, yeah. right? Our body uses amino acids. It doesn't use whole proteins. In fact, if you put, if you inject full proteins into your blood without breaking them up first, it will make you sick. Your body will have a reaction to it. It can be called an allergic reaction, actually, exactly as you would picture somebody puffing up from eating a peanut or something like that, stung by a bee, you know, huge allergic immune response. That's what happens when proteins get into our blood. So our body goes through this immense amount of work to pull foods apart and turn sugars into simpler sugars and turn proteins into amino acids and turn big fatty molecules into essential fatty acids. Mm. And it also more easily accepts tiny little charged particles called colloidal minerals. So it doesn't have to do any work of pulling a rock apart because your stomach can't pull a rock apart properly. Well, mm. it'll harvest a tiny, tiny little bit with the acidity in the stomach and that's it. The rest of it floats through you. And that's why you can take, you know, uh, your thousand milligram calcium capsule per day and it'll probably do absolutely nothing because only at the, uh, Dr. Wallach did that math on his very first doc, uh, Dead Doctors Don't Lie recording CD tape. It was a tape back then, a cassette. He did the math. I don't remember the math right now. I think it's, uh, you're, you're getting less than 40% basically of what's in it. So you'd have to end up taking, you know, most of the bottle every few days. And that's just not realistic. And um, people don't do that. So they don't get the result. Right. So point, you know, why should they get our minerals? Well, again, our minerals are one source of colloidal minerals. It's just a very smart way to do it. You can get colloidal minerals elsewhere. Like we said, you can you could grow sea moss yourself because all the minerals are in seawater. So anything that grows in the sea, especially plants, they suck up those minerals too yeah. into their tissues. But now you've got a bunch of carbon with it as well. Or you've got a bunch of actual sea moss with it as well. A lot of these supplements are just grinding up sea, they're drying the sea moss out, grinding it up and putting it into a capsule. Well, that's not enough. I mean, just just frankly, you have to get rid of the carbon so that you are looking at the true mineral weight. You can get rid of the water by desiccating it, but you're left with the carbon and uh, you know the nitrogen, the, the basic organic tissues. And th the reason that we, uh, we in the wild, we would use wood, right? We would use wood for our cooking and heating uh, mm -hmm. or, or sea moss actually would burn it or rice straw would burn it for our cooking and heating. And the resulting ashes don't have the carbon or have most of the carbon burned away. So they're just, they're more compact. Basically what I'm saying is that sea moss ash would be a lot more bang for the buck than the actual sea moss would. But now they'd be stretching their margins because you have to grow that much more to now burn it to only have a little bit left over. By the way, our humic shale, which is ancient sea moss, it's the same thing, except we didn't have to grow it. We didn't have to harvest it. We didn't have to dry it. We didn't have to burn it. It was desiccated thousands of years ago or however long it's been there. Some people say millions. I don't know. But it's been up there on top of a mountain for a long time, protected from a, by a limestone cap so it doesn't mm -hmm. uh, erode because mm -hmm. the water would wash it away. When you add this stuff to water, it becomes colloidal minerals again. Right? It already is colloidal minerals, but it's not in a solution. I said that a colloidal mineral, the definition, part of the, the technical chemical definition is that it remains in solution. When it's just desiccated sea moss, it's not in solution. 
But when you add it to water, those, those minerals basically float free. And since they have a charge, they repel each other. The charge, the fact that they repel each other is just interesting. But the charge is actually important for absorbing into our body. We're electrical beings. Most of this stuff is, most of the chemical exchanges in our body are based on electricity. There's an electric charge that's exchanged at the same time that a chemical is exchanged yeah. or a neuron is fired or anything like this. Well, this also happens with the villi as it's being absorbed into our tissues. There's an electrical phenomenon. There's an electrical charge. The electrical nature of it is part of it being accepted into our body. Um, so that's, that's very, very important. But why ours? Again, because we already have it dried. It's sitting on top of a mountain. We have a massive uh, uh, parcel of it. And it's over 100 cubic miles. You know, 100 cubic miles. It's huge. It's huge. It's not the only deposit in the world, but ours is nice and tall. It's over, uh, well, it's around 20 feet. We can, we can visit it, right? We can visit it. I've been there. It's great. The uh, Taylor family who operates it, uh, very, very nice people. They gave us a tour out of nowhere. We just showed up one day. It's in the absolute middle of nowhere, by the way. Had to have been an ocean there in Utah at one point. This had to have been a, a massive salt lake because, again, this is sea moss that grew in that lake. It's now on top of a mountain, and there's a limestone cap on top of it full of seashells. So that was buried, you know, for, I guess, a long time. I'm really not sure. Either way, so we have this stuff. Go back to the sea moss and remember that most people who are selling sea moss, which is the most popular alternative to us, by the way, it's our main competitor. Yeah, it, basically, they're attempting to sell all the plant derived minerals in capsule form, usually. And they're just usually grinding it up and it fill the capsule. Well, it takes over 70 pounds to make one bottle of our liquid plant derived minerals. Yeah. If you didn't, I don't think you knew that. It takes over 70 pounds mm. to make 32 ounces. And that's not even at the maximum saturation point, by the way. When you go to Emory, Utah, and you taste it at its full saturation maximum saturation is literally how the maximum amount of particles that can actually fit into a colloidal solution which is amazing now i just wanted to step back again for a minute when you're talking about like individual iron molecules or something like that the fact that they're in a colloidal solution means that you can put thousands of times more of that stuff in it because the particles are so small right when you're using a full big compound a big clump of something you could very easily you get a flake of, of iron, you know, and it's, it's completely useless to you. But there's probably a lot more individual iron particles in the colloidal solution is what I'm saying. Mm. So you can you can get you can fit massive amounts of stuff into a very little because they're nano and pico particles and they'll go as close to each other as they physically can. Right. Because they're repelling each other. And uh, we anyway, so we can put it to the maximum saturation point, but we have to dilute it because human beings can't tolerate it that strong. Dr. Wallach says it uh, shrink wraps or it feels like it shrink wraps your lips around your face. Yeah. And that's real. That's a real statement. If you've ever had the uh, plain plant drive minerals, we call it mineral whiskey in the business, by the way, oh, yeah. we call it mineral whiskey. And uh, it, it, it's, it's harsh. Popular. That's all. That's at the consumer level, right? At the maximum saturation point, it is unreal, unreal how strong this stuff is. And so this is another thing. You, you asked only one question here, but like, we're on long form. We can go long here. Yeah. And you can taste any colloidal mineral you want. There's nothing stronger than ours. There yeah. isn't. Not on the market. Just taste it. Taste is a reference point. The stronger it is, the stronger it will taste. Mm. You can pull your, um, not 32 ounce bottle, by the way. It's meant to last a month. So, you know, one ounce per day for 32 days, basically. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And for, it costs $23 right now, I believe. For that money, you just can't compare it to anything else. So why should they take ours over some? We, remember, we're not talking about any more complicated supplements here. We're not talking about tangy tangerine. We're not talking about OsteoFX. We're not talking about nightly essence and the thousands of products that we have. We're just talking about our colloidal mineral source. Yeah. Our colloidal mineral source is the best, hands down. There's not much of a conversation involved. All you have to, like, this is the objective. All you have to do is look at how much is in the CMOS product, how much is in the Shilajit bought it, bottle, you know? It, you're paying for a bottle that's like this big like our 32 ounce bottle is 23 dollars, and you can look that it has 600 milligrams of this trace mineral complex which again is that it doesn't have the organic material it's been filtered out uh it's been put to its maximum saturation point and diluted a little bit with distilled water 
So there's, there's nothing else in it and there's no competition on those grounds at all. So just, uh, I'll finish now, but just the fact that I want to go back that I mentioned the quality, right? I don't need to come in and say our colloidal minerals are of the highest quality in the world. That's not really what's important. It matters that you get plant derived minerals and that you get enough of them. Yeah. And we have a, a wicked clean source for it. It's pristine. It's organic because it was grown a long time ago, thousands, millions of years ago. I don't know, but it's before pesticides. So there's no pesticides and there's no pollution. It's on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I mean, the middle of nowhere, I mean, the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever driven through Utah. I mean, there's no services for 60 miles, like the middle of nowhere, you know, uh, in a mountain town in the middle of nowhere uh, on top of it. So I want to go for sure. It's clean. We scoop it out. We take giant scoops, right? I mentioned the 20 foot thing. Well, that's important. If you have a, a deposit that's three foot, but it has all the minerals in it, it's going to be a real tough for you to get it out. And I'm just talking about turning it into a product. It's tough to get it out. We use a bulldozer. They use a bulldozer. They scoop it out, right? It's very basic stuff here. We have a big, tall sample. It's huge. And it's, it happens to be tall enough for us to get this big, wide scoop, ensuring that we're getting all of them. That's why we can guarantee at least 77 minerals in every batch. It's because of that full scoop. And it makes it easy to filter easy to transport it down the mountain and you know again mm -hmm. filter out the the carbon compounds that are left and that's it so why should you do ours it's it's the most economical way to do it you can you can try and find another economical way of doing it i don't think you'll find one anything where you have to grow something or actually like if harvest it or or mine it like we say we call ours a mineral mine but again i just described it. it's literally you scoop it out and you filter it in water <clears throat> if you have to do anything more than that it's not going to be economical at all. Right. So all of, all of this, you know, that rain table thing I was talking about earlier, people, if people saw this picture, they would say the obvious question, well, how the heck are the minerals getting back in the soil? Right. You just, we described this thing. The minerals are in the soil. There's this magical process where the plant sucks them up and it turns them into this uh, super interesting and essential form of mineral. It's tiny and it's got an electrical charge. Oh, that's awesome. But remember, we took the plant out and we ate the broccoli for dinner. And then our excess went into the sewer. It didn't go back into the field. So how the heck are the minerals getting back into the field? Right. They don't fall from the sky. You know, they don't come from below. They don't uh, pop up like our skin cells. You know, they don't renew themselves in that way. If you let the field fallow, if you let it sit for a season or two, it doesn't put any more minerals back into the soil. Where do yeah. the minerals come from? Right. 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 Uh, it might put some more nitrogen in. You know, let some, some grass grow and let it die. Put some more nitrogen in, uh, put some more phosphorus, potassium in, put a few little more nutrients in, but it's not really fortifying the soil. All you're doing is stretching out what you have. And uh, it's, it's only going to continue to go down. That's why our graphs, they only go down. There's no place where the mineral content goes up. Let me tell you an even better example. I don't know if I've mentioned this before. I'm from Southern Ontario, Canada, and uh, just north of Toronto, the biggest city in the country. There's this place called the Holland Marsh. It's a lake that they drained to make farmland. And not that long ago. So when I was young, <coughs> excuse me, it was still really, really fresh, really black soil because they just drained the lake, right? So it's it's a really, really, really productive soil. And uh, within a few years, they started measuring the decline in, in important minerals, right? And that just based on everything that we just said, you sh nobody should have ever been surprised by that. But I think they were thinking that this would be like a hundred year thing. Like we just drained this lake and we've got this awesome soil forever. And no, it doesn't work like that. And if they're, they're growing heavily on it, obviously. So they're pulling minerals out every year. And the only thing that's ever going to happen is next year, there's going to be less minerals than this year. Yeah. And that matters because we build our tissues out of minerals. Mm -hmm. I said that we're mostly carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, but we're also minerals, you know especially in our skeletal system is the most obvious, but mm -hmm. the rest of our tissues, they have all these other nutrients that are involved as well. Again, the fatty acids and all that stuff too. So yeah, people need to, people should understand that with the simple water table thing, that if we take minerals out, we have to put them back in somehow. Yeah. And we, we did put them back in, in the past, we irrigated our fields. We mean in human civilization, every city and every, every civilization was built on a floodplain somewhere where the fields could flood every year because the floods brought minerals. They brought mud and they brought silt with them. That's minerals. Even little fish bodies and worms and all this stuff, carrying minerals in from the, from the water. Boom. 
and uh, whether it was a uh, rain floods or it was a river or it was a uh, mountain stream, you know, where the glaciers melt in the spring and bring down mineral rich water. They call it glacial milk because it's white with minerals as these rivers travel through the mountains. Many of the blue zones do live in mountains, by the way, as they travel uh, mm -hmm. through the mountains, they're scraping up all kinds of minerals. They're not colloidal, but they are quite small. You know, rivers will grind them up into quite a small little uh, silt. And then when you put them on the fields, the plants will do their thing, their magic, and they'll pull those apart even further and give them an electrical charge. Yeah. And uh, th that's how people fortified their fields. Yeah. That, that's it. That's the answer. We, we dammed rivers. We dammed a million rivers in the world, nearly a mil million rivers. Uh, so we no longer have flooding. We have flood control is what they've sold it as. Technology, like man. So it's set us back. We already mentioned wood ashes. Those are concentrated plant-derived minerals. You mm -hmm. can eat the plants, but you can't eat that many plants to get that many minerals. So mm -hmm. when you burn them, you concentrate mm -hmm. them, especially with trees and roots. Yeah. So took both those away with damming the rivers. Now that water table thing is interrupted. That's a, it used to happen that we'd grow the stuff on the fields. We'd take the plants away and eat them. But then next spring for the next growing season, the river would flood again, or the rains would come again, and your fields would be flooded with yeah. mud. Yep. and silt and, and the farmers you know, would come they, out and they rake it in they hoe it, it in yeah yep. they, they'd mash it all in there uh they'd usually use the compost for their personal you know if it's a big farm they'd use the compost for their personal uh gardens or whatever but most primitive societies have massive compost heaps as well so they're saving all the leftovers of everything grinding up the bones eating the bones making bone soups and even what's left of that still goes into the compost heap so they've got these massive compost heaps. I'm not talking about a little box in the backyard. I'm talking about a, a pile that's as big as your house, you know, that's constantly added to with human and animal manure, vegetable scraps, leaf clippings and yard cuttings and, you know, massive organic piles that would be raked in along with the fields, along with the floods every year after the floods. Yeah. So you've got this, this rich uh, topsoil as well. And neither of those things happen. If you put nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium on, you are enriching the topsoil. You're stretching out its life, but it will be a dust bowl eventually, if, uh, unless, again, unless you put more minerals in, and it's just not going to happen without something as big as a flood. You know, we're not going to come in with bags. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen a 30 acre farm. You know, you're not going to go with little bags of soil that you would buy for your garden and cover the whole field. Like, this is, it's never going to happen that way. It's never going to be. Yeah feasible in that way that's why it was never even proposed seriously you know people just didn't connect the dots that it was flooding that put minerals back in in the first place yeah well, speaking of minerals there's a lot of people that are scared of salt out there big community of people that are scared of salt especially the plant-based folks and there was this video i want to i want to play it real quick and get your reaction I saw this one. Yeah. This goes viral every now and then. I saw it a few times. Let's take a peek. Oh, I'm not getting any sound here. Ah, oh, here we go. Jeez, it's a big statement there. Yeah, what's super. what say you? Well, he actually just said a very simple version of the whole thing we just went through that we are supposed to absorb organic minerals. Yeah. But sodium chloride is different and very special. Um, first of all, it's not a new thing to consume salt. This is not something that industrial people came up with. No, uh, we've carried this practice throughout all of history. It's where um, the word salary comes from. That's where the word salary came from. Uh, uh, reportedly, apparently, Roman soldiers uh, were sometimes paid in salt, not always. Uh, actually, all the way up to the American, uh, I think it was the Civil War. It might have been the War of 1812, but American soldiers were paid in salt brine, salt brine at some points, actually. 
uh, so that's that's one thing. But go back further. I mean, Neolithic sites are almost always next to a massive salt deposit, mm. and uh, the ones that are uh, like that, if it wasn't all of them, I assume those other ones we just haven't found found the salt deposit yet. Actually, as I believe that every civilization would have been built near a uh, salt salt mine of some kind. Uh, many major uh, cities that you would have heard of, uh, especially those with the suffix of aiming an ick or itch, mm. uh, even like like Munich or Summerwick or you know, Northwich and all, all these English towns and German towns, those with the itch, those mean that they're a salt town. You know, those mean that they were important on the, in the salt economy. Mm. And this could have been a salt mining location or it could have been a location along a salt road. The phrase, uh, all roads lead to Rome, very likely referred to salt roads. Every Roman um, place is found near a salt mine. Roman settlement, every major Roman settlement is found near a salt mine. And uh, yeah, the all roads lead to Rome, very likely meant salt roads. Uh, most of the, uh, many of the most important cities around the world, especially in Europe, uh, are there because they exist on a salt road, right? So they could, salt, they could tax the salt that passes through their territory. That's why they became powerful and turned into kingdoms and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why taxes and armies and policemen were made up to protect the King's peace and the king very likely got that power because of salt. Now, in less uh, uh, advanced, uh, I don't even want to kind of get into the hidden history of the uh, it's what was in America before we uh, arrived there. But from what we're told, the natives in America did not usually build their residences near salt mines. But that's why there was such a rich trade uh, society in America pre-Columbus or pre, pre-modernization uh, because they didn't all live next to salt mines. They relied heavily on trade, especially with the, uh, the salt flats out in the West, right? In the uh, Utah, California, Nevada area, massive salt flats. And that's just because it's so much work to get salt from seawater. But I'm saying that, you know, no matter where you look, everybody's getting salt somehow. Mm -hmm. And people who are living on seafood and stuff, there is salt in seafood. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they have salt in their tissues. So that's, that's one major way a lot of humanity has lived near the sea, right? So that I'm just saying that this guy's claiming that, oh, we don't need these nutrients. Well, salt has always been a part of humanity. And I believe it's more than 50% actually of humanity lives near the sea. So in historical times, a, a huge proportion um, of humanity was still living on seafood. And that's how we would get most, if not all of our salt. You could, if you lived exclusively on seafood, you could get enough salt that way, I believe. Uh, so a few other foods have a little bit of chloride in it and we'll get to why it's different than uh than rocks it's not it's not a rock he called it a rock it's not a rock it's salt it's a, and it's salt doesn't have to be sodium chloride by the way the group called salt can be all kinds of different things it's it's a fundamentally different thing because it does dissolve in water it does turn into a solution mm. rocks do not turn into a solution only only vaguely and mildly you know but by the way, even something like orange juice is a solution, and it's a colloidal solution too, because the minerals that were in the orange are colloidal. That's so right. It remains a colloidal solution. You can leave your orange juice on your counter; it's not going to settle out. It's going to still be orange juice in a week. Might not be good, but it's still going to be um, orange juice. Yeah. So, yeah, all throughout human history, Neolithic times, Roman times, whatever time you want to look at, uh, people we were using salt. Even more primitive people, like the American natives, had these again hugely hugely important trade routes across the whole country the whole continent in fact to trade salt with each other salt was like the primary thing uh, definitely could have been used as currency um the, especially between tribes for big things probably not for individual little transactions but uh huge huge hugely important every population knew this uh all the wild people out there know this now you know the i mean they they go for salt their animals go for salt Right. The, the, the most primitive humans I've heard, by the way, the paleo, I've read paleo books and stuff, and they literally say, oh, yeah, you go out to the Amazon and these uh, these tribes don't use salt. They, they do, though. Like, they do. Like, it's, this is recorded anthropologically. They do consume salt and they do consume foods that are high in salt. And they know because they can watch the parrots and and the anteaters and the armadillos and they can watch creatures and those creatures find salt. And if they keep animals, if they keep llamas or, or cattle or anything like that, buffalo, they know, they have to know, or they have to figure it out, or they're not going to have any animals left. They have to know that their animals need salt. Yeah. Or again, they won't have animals. The animals won't be able to reproduce in a couple generations. Right. 
or this is not new this is not news this is not just humans this is not just industrial all animals need salt all life needs salt in fact there's no th such thing as microbial life without salt salt is absolutely required for even cells to transmit stuff like this is i mentioned that we're electrical and there's a reason why there's a reason why it's in the saline solution when you go to the emergency room god forbid they <laughs> get salt in you yeah, if you're dying, it's one of the most uh, useful things to do is to inject salt into people. Uh, if you have heat stroke, that's what they're going to do. I've had heat stroke before. I just had a salty glass of water and it brought me back to life. You know, uh, so if you're in an emergency, salt can absolutely save your life. So for this person to be like, oh, we don't we don't need any of these 84 elements. He's correct with the colloidal part. But when it comes to sodium and chloride, you actually do need them. And again, you're not absorbing a rock. It going into your stomach. It's not going into the intestine to be absorbed. It's supposed to actually break apart in the stomach acid. Put some salt in vinegar. You're going to see it break apart, right? So your stomach acid breaks it apart and it liberates those two elements separately. And both of them are, are ridiculously important, by the way, yeah. like sodium and chloride. Usually we just talk about chloride because you need chloride to make stomach acid. You need a super strong stomach acid to absorb the other minerals, especially the tough ones already mentioned, iron and calcium. You need an extremely strong stomach acid or it's not going to be absorbed properly. And some other nutrients too, like cobalt, which is mm. part of the B12 molecule, right? B12, it, it's a, it surrounds a ring of, a, it's a ring surrounding cobalt. Very interesting. It's the same molecular uh, structure as hemoglobin and as chlorophyll actually. But the hemoglobin, it's the same structure and it uses iron. And the um, chlorophyll is the exact same structure as B12, except it's magnesium. That's what makes it, it green, is the magnesium. Same structure. Very, very interesting, those, those three things. Anyways, you need an extremely strong stomach acid to absorb any of that or vitamin C and the, and the list just goes on and on. So it's absolutely important. And it's done in the stomach first. It's not done in the intestine. So as long as your stomach yeah. acid is a little bit acid to begin with, it's going to pull that apart. It's going to make more stomach acid with it. Yeah, and the sodium is going to be used in every nerve transaction everywhere in your body. Everything that's being done in your body, yeah. basically. Every message. And remember, a... Uh, uh, a hormone is just like a messenger, you know, a gland is something that produces something to be used somewhere else. Well, to get anything in the body to go anywhere, an enzyme or a hormone or whatever, a neurotransmitter, to get where it needs to go, it needs sodium. It's called the sodium channel, you know, to, to get accepted into the next cell, it needs sodium. It's a transaction there, yeah. an electrical transaction. So they're, they're massively important. This is massively misunderstood. Uh, the paleo people that are saying that primitive people don't use salt, they are simply mistaken. If they're cooking their meat at all, they definitely need salt. The, I believe we're, we're meant to eat raw meat, by the way. So these primitive people that are eating raw meat, if they are eating raw meat, they don't need as much salt, actually. You don't need that much salt to consume raw meat. The more you cook it, the more salt you actually need. Mm. So hopefully those paleo people are, are putting salt on their meat and stuff where they're going to have stomach problems. Because unless you're living off seafood, like already mentioned, and a few other little plants, rare plants, you're not going to get enough of the chloride at all. Yeah. Probably get sodium, but not the chloride. Ultimately, we're right back to one of the root causes of disease, and that's not having battery acid in your stomach. <laughs> Salt deficiency is definitely behind a, a disproportionate amount of misery and disease in this world, yes, for sure. Absolutely. And when I saw this video, within 10 seconds, I knew this was going to be a plant-based guy. You, 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 it's, uh, it's a stereotype at this point. You know, it's, it's just so predictable. And all I had to do was wait to the end of the video. And here comes the pitch for raw food. <laughs> here comes the pitch for raw broccoli and raw this and raw that. And, you know, I don't know how, how many more years this is going to last this dogma type nutritional theory well you um, were around a few years ago it was a lot more popular a few years ago it's yeah, dying, it's out dying down quickly, let me tell you. It's honestly kevin down. i i think that uh carnivore md carnivore md 2.0 i forget his real name uh dr I, salandino I dr salandino i think he's behind a, a huge transformation and I mean, there's probably some other people as well, but like I'm giving him so much credit. Yeah, he's he's become so popular right now, and and his message has seeped in. And I think it takes it too far, you know that. But 
the the fact that it's turned so many people from veganism to the exact opposite direction in carnivore i think is an amazing thing i think we're a little bit better off in that in that direction hopefully we go more towards omnivore but i'd like to mention something if you like i know you like the you like the deep stuff on this podcast stuff that we're not going to ever be able to go into um in detail elsewhere really not in post form for sure so i probably i might have mentioned it before as well but i like talking about it so even mainstream science believes that cooking food, by the way, is, is behind our intelligence. They believe that the, the reason that we became, more, some people believe in the mainstream, believe that uh, at the point we evolved, you know, this is part of the, the evolution explanation of things, but they believe that we evolved to this next level of intelligence because of the cooking of food. And they believed it was because it allowed us to have a uh, more different foods basically mm-hmm. you know the uh, even meats you cook it it lasts a little bit longer that kind of thing uh, but you can eat re- roots now and and many more vegetables and and stuff that we couldn't eat before stuff that was too tough before even some like nuts big nuts you know you got to roast them but you can't really eat them at all and you can't eat an acorn you know you got to roast it but um so they believe that this new variety of food allowed us to be more intelligent uh and i say that because these raw vegans, they don't have much of a case here because, you know, even the mainstream believes that uh, the food has something to do with, with our intelligence because of all the new nutrients that we're exposed to. Mm. Very, very difficult by, by any chemical theory of how you would get all your nutrients with just raw vegetables. But let me say that we don't believe it's because of the food, by the way. Dr. Wallach believes it's because of the wood ashes. That it, the fact that we were cooking food meant that we had fire. And yeah. the fact that we had fire meant that we had wood ashes left That's over. Right. And That's somebody right. had to notice that those wood ashes, wherever they piled up, that those food, that those plants had to grow better, faster, and that they had to have bigger berries and fruits or yeah. whatever was growing there. They had to be more impressive that someone noticed it and humans started using it as fertilizer and eating it as well at some point. I, I agree. I, I think it's minerals. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard the Joe Rogan theory. His theory is that is that caveman came across mushrooms okay and had magic mushrooms but i i think i i think it's humans coming across minerals and more minerals and then being able to expand out not only more minerals but the the trace minerals and the rare earth minerals yeah i love this this one too next level down uh, in deepness here so what makes our phone smart is the same minerals, you know, that would be concentrated in, in wood ashes, right? Our technology keeps getting smarter and smarter because we keep putting more exotic minerals in them, more rate, uh, rare earth minerals in them, you know, and uh, gallium and cobalt and all, all these things, you know, well, you, a lot of people only know the names of some of these exotic minerals, lithium and so on, uh, because they're in their phones. That's where they've heard it. But no, these are actually exotic trace minerals that we need a tiny, tiny little amount of. And mm. people ask, how would I get europium in the wild right if it's only available in the natural environment in these tiny tiny nano amounts like parts per million is like nothing you know how are we how would we get some how would we get gallium if it's 0.000007 parts per million in the soil yeah you know or part or in seawater you know 0.0003 or whatever the numbers are if it's if it's only that in seawater, how the heck would we ever get enough gallium? And the answer is concentrated in it in plant derived minerals with ashes, right? It burn away all that carbon. We're talking about pounds per day for a wood uh, stove or fireplace. Pounds of the stuff per day, concentrated trace minerals and rare minerals that make our smartphones smart, and we believe they make us smart as well. And so that that was the source of our intelligence. We had this magic pixie dust, this magic powder that was not only loaded with the constituent components of our, our structure, again, the iron, iron, calcium, and, and magnesium, and boron, and strontium, and all those structural components, not only did it have that, but it also has the magic pixie dust, the stuff that we do need in parts per million, you know, that we need in this tiny, tiny little speck amount, but it's spread out throughout the earth so, so widely that the only way to get it is in a concentrated form. And plants concentrate minerals, especially trees, too. Big, big long root systems, right? Those roots that yeah. rather than growing something in the topsoil, like the cabbage or broccoli we were talking about earlier, little tiny roots in the topsoil, you take that out, it's gone. Those roots don't have an opportunity to dig deep into the earth, but trees do. And many vines do. They got these huge tentacle roots. 
And so they have more access to find out these minerals, to seek them out, search them out. Just like that uh, stream going through the mountains, it's taking up all kinds of minerals as it's going through, right? Yeah. These things concentrate these, these minerals and it's the only way to do it. You, you have to get a source like a mountain stream or something, uh, some spring water that has it. There are some certain places that have certain high concentrations of these exotic minerals, by the way. Most of them are known as healing waters, like Lourdes and uh, France. You know, the, the, any place that's got healing waters, so-called healing waters, you can look at the waters there. Probably high in silica, probably high in lithium, probably high in gallium, you know. So very interesting. Not only could they make us smarter, they definitely make our technology smarter. And we keep putting these minerals into our phones, making them smarter, forgetting to put them in our own bodies, making us dumber. Mm. Shifting from nutrition a little bit. You know, I've made perhaps a discovery that the people with the four big gut dysfunctions, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis, I've noticed a trend that they've either had their gallbladder taken out or they have sway back posture. And I think this could be a very big discovery. What do you mean by sway back? With, sway, back with sway back is when your hips are jolted out in front of your knees and your, and your, uh, let me see if I can get a picture, and your ankles. And let's see. We still got that guy. And so there we go. There's an example. Okay. Yeah. So the hips are out in front. You see that? Mm. And the shoulders come back because the body's automatically trying to stay upward. Mm. This is so putting an incredible nerve. strain on the gut. And I can't corroborate exactly what's happening with the organs, but something's happening. I believe because it. I think, as you know, from being in this business a while, every now and again, you get someone with one of those big gut dysfunctions and the nutrition doesn't heal them hundred percent and they just keep have still having flare-ups. Oh, I've and seen I it. Go ahead. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's this. I think it's sway back posture, which is much more common now. Uh, it's a very weak posture. Um, very weak people. Like you could, you could shove them mildly and they'd probably almost fall over. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's been my little discovery. It's been gallbladder or sway back. And, you know, somebody with both, forget about it. So, you know, the salty water and the 90 essential nutrients and getting off the bad foods sometimes might not be enough. That sway back has to be corrected because the guts, there's just pressure on those guts. And something's happening that's creating the inflammation, that flare up. It could be food getting stuck, like it's just not flowing through the pipes. Because all posture really is, is the position of your musculoskeletal system, right? So you think about basketball, right? It's like the hoop is supposed to be level. <laughs> if the hoop is tilted like this, it makes it harder to hit a shot. And it's the same thing with our, our intestines and our organs. If, if they're, if they're all, you know, messed up, then things just can't flow like they're supposed to. And I don't know if you've noticed from doing some postural therapy, some of the ones I've sent you, but even sometimes you get into that static back position and all of a sudden you're like, Oh, you know, a bowel movement might be coming in a little bit. I feel, feel that. Yeah. 
actually i've had some times where i've um my stomach's been uncomfortable for one reason or another and i, I actually just do that i go into static back yeah yeah because you're 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 putting everything back in alignment it the floor is automatically putting you back and your organs are like ah <laughs> It should be called the organ. Ah, that's what it should be called because that's what's happening. Is is everything is just like, oh, okay. Let's line it all back up. And then of course you stand back up and walk through the world and it's like, oh, you know, it takes time for it to come back naturally. So I I think that this is a possible big discovery. And definitely keep your eyes open. Um with you know customers coming through and well this is why i like having you around dr reese because <laughs> uh, i can't look at them usually honestly unless you do the p rate thing i don't get to look at people yeah it's crazy it, I, I don't even think about it that often because it's just kind of it's it's just kind of what we do but uh the fact that we do this blind it, it it's got to be amazing the fact that we can help so many people blind yeah i, I know what you're saying not everybody gets help from the initial basics. Uh, and of course, lots of people do, but the ones who don't, now we need to deal with them. And uh, it can be their posture. I 100% agree. And by the way, I didn't, you know, I haven't given my little testimonial here, but my posture was terrible before. Chiropractors helped it a little bit, but I was born with my hips dislocated and I walked up foot forever. And, you know, Dr. Reese did the, the P ray thing with me, looked at my posture, told me what to do to correct it. And, Honestly, within two to three months, the results were probably at 90%, you know, yeah. I probably just got a little, a couple little percent left to just straighten it out, straighten my shoulders out still a little bit and uh, but massive progress in just a few months. Absolutely. It's helped me in my day to day. And if, and if it was worse, you know, it could absolutely have contributed to something like a nerve pinching or something. And if it's not yet, it might be eventually, that's the problem with posture. As you said, it's, it's the way that your musculoskeletal system sits all the time, right? So right. If, uh, if you're sitting incorrect all the time, then some, whatever nerves are in that area or whatever joints are in that area, something's getting worn down. Yeah. And and, and, nerve, that's going to be a big deal. And like I wrote, you know, in the Peace Over Pain book, it, it could be coming from the biochemical side or it could be coming from the musculoskeletal side. Uh, sciatica is a great example. It could be coming from either or migraines could be either or gut dysfunction could be either or or it could be both you know because yeah, i've met people with migraines who you know it could be a food allergy or they're just inflamed from eating the bad foods or their neck is so messed up from you know computers and, and phones and whatnot doing this and they're just not getting flow from that neck up to the brain it's just lack of oxygen at that point. Same thing with eye trouble too. So, you know, that's why at, at our clinic, we, we have both. And uh, it's quite, quite um, cool to see. Um, By the way, I didn't notice how bad mine was either until you pointed it out that I was looking down, basically. I was trying to stand up straight and I'm looking yeah. down. Your heads are like this. Yeah, and I I truly try not to spend much time on on the phone. And your but... femurs too. Your femurs were rotated out because your yeah. your feet were like this. Well, I can't blame that one on technology. That that's the hips. The hips, uh, right? But now the they're in. Like, it makes a huge difference to have our head up straight. <laughs> huge, huge, yeah, huge difference. Crazy well, that watching TV is actually healthier than being on the phone. <laughs> For that reason. Yeah. Well, I I've noticed that. You know, when I got into all this, I even I, I walk a lot. I go for walks. It's one of my things. I noticed that I'd go for a walk and I'd be looking down. Phone or no phone. Your it head sits in that position naturally yeah. now. The, your body becomes, it's muscle memory. You become comfortable. Like, oh, this is more comfortable. And so now you got to come up ah, and, and you got to change the memory of, of the muscles. It's insane i i met a woman yesterday I did a little tv interview yesterday and she was talking about her sciatica and that she had horrible sciatica pain and 
she was making the rounds for the doctors. And of course that was going nowhere as we know. And one day she woke up and it was gone. And the doctor's like, oh, you still want to come in and blah, blah, blah. No, I think I'm good. And she's like, what could have happened? Now, this isn't one of our customers. This is just a random woman, doesn't know anything about the bad foods, doesn't know anything about the 90 essential nutrients. How long did she have it for before it went away? Like a month. Okay. And so my explanation to her was posture. Her hip must have been tilted the mu from muscle dysfunction. And, you know, the sciatica comes through the, um, the hoop by the pelvis, you know, and boom, it gets pinched. So something must have happened in her life where her pelvis must have came back and it, it just released. And it's just like that, boom, it's gone, right? Yeah. And the explanation and I had a cord near me, so I was able to say, well, this is your sciatica. <laughs> this is your, this is the notch, you know, and if it pinches and the explanation that I gave her was like so liberating for her because it was like, oh, that makes sense. I think part of what we do that makes us miracle workers, so to speak, is just being able to explain things because the medical monopoly can't. They have no explanations. Well, I like how you use the word can't instead of don't. <laughs> some people use the word don't and it makes it look like, oh, they're just being, they're just being uh, uh, arrogant or something. They're just not spending their time with their clients. Yeah. But you use the word can't. They can't. It's, it's true. They, they actually can't they explain actually why can't. you have sciatic pain. Nope. They might even say pinch nerve, but they don't have an, a, a protocol what to do about it. They don't have a way to fix you. Yeah, nope. most of the time, they just can't explain it. They can't explain what causes heartburn. They can't explain what causes cancer or anything in between. You know, so yeah, that, that is one of the most valuable things we do. That's why we can do this blind for the most part. And if more people know about posture, if we keep talking about posture, I bet people will figure that out on their own too and come back to us. Like some people come back to us in three months and say, Hey, I heard you guys listening about posture. I realized my posture was really trash. And uh, actually I was feeling good on the nutrients, but now I'm at a whole new level because I didn't realize how big of a thing this was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and we give a free routine in the book. Um, people can get the free routine of uh, the frog on a rock, real simple routine. I just started LaShawn, our, our buddy LaShawn on it today. And he says he's, you know, he's feeling better already. So uh, that just this, just this 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening is very easy, you know? Um, well, you guys had me on a couple that were a bit longer than 15 minutes. Yeah. Ago, we're trying to challenge still, you. <laughs> still, still. It's worth it. it. It is, man. And, and once you start getting in alignment, you can start doing one hour routines. Then you start building some muscle and, and things like this. And you can start getting back to your design which I like to call tribal design because when we were in tribes and we were, you know, getting better minerals naturally and all this, you know, we, you know, weren't sitting down at computers. We weren't looking down at our phones. These things didn't exist. We weren't scrunched up in cars. And so it's our tribal design to be, erect and have a nice little S curve in the spine and our muscles are functionable and, you know, right back to the whole mineral thing with, with wood ashes and, and, and damming rivers technology has, is our gift and our curse. And we'll never be out of business. That's for sure. Because everyone needs correction at this point. It's it's insane. And from a posture perspective, my prediction is that the new big thing is going to be neck surgeries. So we already know knee, knee and yeah. hips are through the roof. It's going to be neck because everyone's got the tech neck, which is called cervical flexion or lordosis of the cervical. Um, 
and the medical monopoly is going to capitalize. And so you're going to start seeing 25 year olds getting neck surgery. Because you think they're going to replace vertebrae? Do you think they'll put uh, like uh, like braces in? Man, I don't know. I don't know. There's some some scientist is going to invent some metal cervical spine, and they're going to put it in there. And hey, while you're in there, let's put one of Tesla's, uh, one of Elon Musk's contraptions, so you can start getting the. Yeah, it's gonna go crazy. We're it's like the Terminator movie. Well, you gotta consider that you can't really you yeah you, know, you can't really use the phone comfortably in a proper posture position. Mm-hmm. Like when I was a kid, I had to wear neck braces sometimes because I would pop my muscle out because I was all messed up from the hip being dislocated and nutrient deficiencies. Mm-hmm. But so you're stuck like this, right? And I I remember it being like, okay, I can watch TV. I used to like to make models in my room on my little desk. And I had the brace on and I couldn't make models because I couldn't look down. You know, I couldn't just couldn't get into that position properly. But you couldn't do that with a phone. You'd have to be like this. But that's how you're supposed to sit, right? You're supposed to sit like this. But nobody sits like this on their phone. Right. It just doesn't work like that. So, you know, I'm just saying that we we literally can't use this technology in a way that our spine is aligned. We can't. Maybe if you're laying down or something like me. Still, it's not. There's no way to do it healthily. There's no way around this. Well, we do have, we do have special glasses, and they shoot down. Really? Yeah. Like uh, we like like you like you you have these. Uh, all postural therapists use it. You can get it oh, on okay. Amazon. Really? Yeah. Look at you. You're about to go on. <laughs> I'm interested. Yeah. So you so you can have your phone or your book down like really this. Can. Yeah, and the glasses shoot down. Wow. Yeah, I I would show you, but they're in the other room. I'm interested. And, yeah. There's you know fifteen dollar contraption. Mm. And and so we use them for static back or if you're if we're in the tower. We haven't put you in the tower yet. But when you're in the tower, you're laying down for an hour and your foot's up. So you know, some people get bored. Not everyone's a meditator, you know. So yeah. you wear the glasses and you can read a magazine or play play around on your phone. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So the other thing people can do if anyone wants to is just stand up straight, put your feet into put your feet in the pigeon toe position. Take your toes like this. Get your shoulders back, put your arms on your head like this. Woo! And all of a sudden your 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 hips start to tilt automatically and your head starts to go back on your shoulders. And people might notice that they're sore the next day. Like, how the heck did that make me sore? Because your neck's not in position. And all of a sudden, you kind of, because it's all hip. It's all hips. It's all well, I'll hips. tell you, I've been, I've been really, really sore on some of the routines that you guys have given me. I'm talking really yeah. soreness I've never felt before. And, you know, I was into the bodybuilding before. I know about being sore at the gym. <laughs> this was the next level. It was like a... Uh, literally is like the soreness was i'm imagining it's where the muscles connecting to the bone like it's so deep within me yeah that sounds like a complaint but like no this means that it did something especially that routine that the one that's uh this will make you taller and you mentioned the pigeon toe it's got the pigeon toe in it you're doing the the clock thing with your thumbs out on the wall oh my gosh so sore honest i couldn't move man for a few like switching routines usually I'm, yeah. I'm wrecked the next week. Wreck. Yeah. Right. So, Takes a few days to get used to a new, a new. But that's bad, bad posture. You know, like it shouldn't hurt that much to do posture exercises. They're they're not that intense. Well, it, 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 it's interesting. Muscles are fascinating. There's almost 700 of them, and we only understand half from a science perspective because there's no way to study the other half because. The only way to get to them is on a corpse and they're not moving anymore. So scientifically, we have no idea. That's fascinating to me. And we also have superficial muscles like a trapezius is superficial. I could touch it right now. There's all these little muscles underneath that you can't get to. Some of them are this big. 
it's insane. And so what you're probably feeling is those deep posture muscles, you know? And, and so not only do we need to do the postural therapy, we need to feed them 700 muscles. We need to feed them. This is soft tissue, right? This is where our selenium comes in and our magnesium. And, uh, well, our muscles weigh more than our bones too, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Especially our connective you... tissue weighs more than the bones. Yeah. Yeah. And bones are, bones are fascinating too. There's about 200 of them, you know, and fascia. Oh, forget about it. Fascia is like, fascia is like rubber bands. So if your hips being pulled up, you know, it's, it's like a crossing, you know, this side's up, that's affecting this side down here. It's like, you know, you're walking around in this rubber band system. It's very fascinating. It's, uh, but it's a tag team effort. And, and this is what, you know, my message is, is you know, we got to do both. Um, I guess that's a good way to wrap it all up and together. Eh? Uh, that's uh, just like, you're not going to accidentally get your nutrients. And we just talked to a whole bunch about uh, yeah. how they're supposed to be in the soil. And like, it's, it's, they're not going to magically float into your body. Mm -mm. Well, your posture is also going to, to go down the toilet unless you stop it. Truly. And every new advancement that we come out with uh, technology and work and all this, it's putting us into worse and worse posture positions permanently. You know, uh, imagine the average day, sun up to sundown, it is filled with bad posture at work, on the bus, at the car, in the car, even like it's not good posture. We gotta, we gotta work against this, uh, or we're gonna suffer for it. You can suffer pain from, from muscular problems. You can suffer pain from digestion problems, eating the wrong foods. You can mm -hmm. also by not putting the nutrients in that are supposed to be in the soil. Mm -hmm. But you got to be proactive. Like you said, it's a tag team effort. Your body will perform miracles, but you have to do your end. That's right. I always tell people, treat your body like it's a pet. Because you're, you're, you're not your body, it, but, but it's your responsibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, most people, I mean, there are some irresponsible scumbags out there, but most people take care of their dog better than they take care of themselves. You know, well, people wouldn't even realize that even if they're buying the cheapest uh, dog food, dog food from Walmart, that it's loaded with nutrients Yeah, that you are, you actually are doing better for the dog than you're doing for yourself yep. on old Roy. And, and they say you, you, you got to walk or play with your dog for a reason because otherwise it will lay there and it will develop muscle dysfunction. And so that's posture, you know, and, you know, dogs are meant to, to run and, and, and play. And I think, I don't know for sure, but my theory is that's why big dogs die so quick. The Great Danes and the Rottweilers. I mean, these dogs don't last long. They're not a Labrador retriever lived to almost 20. You know, little dogs <laughs> lived to 80. <laughs> but these big, massive lie. dogs, you got seven years at best because i just don't think they're designed for these little homes they're like horses you know they need to be out and moving and you know they always you have animal experience you know as soon as a hip goes on a dog it ain't much long later well uh if we're talking about big dogs yeah i'm thinking of real big dogs i'm thinking of mountain dogs uh, it's step above the Great Dane and everything. I'm thinking about dogs that are really, really heavy, and I know it's really tough on their skeleton. So in those cases, in those dogs, you can't actually just go to the grocery store and buy big dog formula because big dogs they're they're meaning golden retrievers when when you buy big dog formula. Yeah. So if you, I mean, I to my knowledge, I don't think there's a really big dog formula on the general market. You could go to a, a specialized thing for that, but uh, what I'm saying is. I think the primary problem is calcium deficiency because mm. they're so massive and I'm familiar with a couple of massive dogs that uh, died real young. And I think that's, I think that's it. Even the big dog food is not enough. They need, they need calcium. 
big, big time. They need bone meal basically uh, in heavy quantities because, yeah, they're just, they're bigger. Could than we give them osteo FX? Yeah, you could. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. I, I would give them agricultural grade calcium and probably alfalfa as well. I know the, the dog's not exactly designed to eat that, but we're talking, we did this, you know, a Burmese mountain dog is not a natural creation. It's not supposed to be that big. It's the size of a bear and it's supposed to be the size of a, a, a Labrador retriever. Mm. Right. So yeah, you need a, you need a massive extra dose. I just wouldn't do it with osteo effects. We're talking about 200 pound dogs and stuff, you know, I'm not going to do it with osteo. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay 90 bucks a month for my, for my dog on top of the dog food and not, you know, everything else. Like it's just, yeah. I would use agricultural grade calcium, just a massive, massive boost. I would give it bones, uh, you know, all day, every day sort of thing. Yeah, yeah no, no, they're, they're not very healthy uh, in general. It's tough. They're, they're a tough animal. And uh, yeah, you're right. The small dogs, they have a lot less problems. And I agree with you now that I'm thinking about it. You know, we had some dogs that lived to like 20 years old and stuff. And a little dog can just run around your living room. It doesn't really need to, to go out. But yeah, you're, uh, you're a German Shepherd cannot do that. And it will get a hip problem if it sits around too much. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's just a lot of, a lot to think about. Um, my last thing before we wrap up in your experience, what the heck causes balding male pattern balding multiple things, soft tissue deficiencies, uh, soft tissue deficiencies. Yeah. That's the most obvious one. That's probably the, the main one. Like when, when I see anybody, I remember back in high school, you know, I had some friends in high school that were losing their hair. That has to be gluten intolerance, in my opinion. Mm. You know, just, there's got to be something bigger than normal. Mineral deficiencies. Yeah, sure. I know Dr. Wallach's always talking about tin and some other minerals as well, including copper. But uh, yeah, so that's going to be a thing for sure, for sure. And the, the longer you live, the more likely that is. But uh, the problem is with hair, as far as I can tell, once it starts to fall out, it's really difficult to, to reverse it. So. I mean, whether it was good fat or mineral deficiency or radiation, by the way, EMF radiation from all our electrical devices uh, or some longstanding uh, digestion problem, anything like that. Once it starts, it's really, really tough to reverse. What about I, hats? I, I have not gotten to the bottom of this at all, by the way. You're a hat guy. I'm a hat guy. Yeah. Does hat contribute to it? I don't know. I think that's a bit of an old wise tale. Yeah. The truth. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not balding at all. You know, I'm doing good right now. I notice my hair starts to turn gray when I'm in Texas uh, because we're in a much higher radiation environment. We're right out of Houston and we're close to a cell phone tower. We're moving right now. I'm supposed to be there helping moving, by the way. I turned around on the border, big, long story. But uh, we're moving right now, so that shouldn't be a big of a problem. But I'm saying I notice it within days. Like I notice it. I notice it just taking a trip. You know, I've got it to get from my house to anywhere else. I got to drive a whole day to get to a city, basically hop on a plane or something like that. By the time I get to my des destination, I notice several grays in my beard and in my hair. Wow. And I notice that when I'm there, it's like they're co they come in like scary fast. I've been here for just over a month now. I see no grays at all. You know, so I, I caught it quick, I guess. But uh, once it really starts happening, it's tough to reverse. I always thought that, uh, I'm not sure if this is true, but I always thought that when hair turns gray, it like bleaches the ones around it, like releases a, a, a chemical that affects the ones around it. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyways, I think a lot of things contribute to it. I think stress is one of those big ones, too. You know, people are always commenting, why is Dr. Wallet bald? Well, if you go on the road for 30 plus years, you'll probably be bald, too. <laughs> Honestly, stress, long nights, radiation. Not only not even that, a digestion problem. Not only that, I would go back to posture too, because if we're flex forward again, we're not getting oxygen and <laughs> blood mm -hmm. to our head properly, or we're not draining lymph properly. And yeah. so, you know, you could be burning the hair from the from the inside. It's it's a possibility somewhere. I agree. I agree. So. It could happen to anyone, I think. And yeah, once it started happening, even if you crack your digestion, even if you crack the deficiencies, we do not guarantee hair coming back. Just uh, it's one of those things. Can't yeah. guarantee it. You should still do those things anyways. You should still crack digestion. You should still be nourished. But for men especially, really, really tough to get hair back. 
I have seen it. I stopped mine in its tracks 10 years ago when I was vegan and my hair was falling out in clumps, handfuls, you know, and it was really, really gray and scraggly. And it came back when I, I put eggs back in and uh, eventually I added meat back in and all that. And it, it's, it's been fine, been no problem. Females tend to get their hair back a lot faster, by the way. Like females is almost 100%. If a female is losing her hair, it's a hormone problem. Yeah. Probably a digestion problem as well. I, I would assume they have other, if we asked them the questionnaire, I would I would assume PCOS or endometriosis yeah. or early menopause or hysterectomy, yeah. something like yeah. that. I'd, most of the time, if not, they're obviously obese. They obviously have a digestion problem and that's going to affect the absorption of the good fats, as you know. Yeah. So women can turn it all around, actually, almost 100% of the time. I'm yeah. so confident with women. It's incredible. And even if they have a mustache too at the same time, which happens, it happens. Yeah. Women lose the hair again. It's usually a hormone problem. You usually have a mustache as well. That can go away too. No problem. And if it's obesity causing it, they can lose the weight. That's no problem too. Yeah. Agreed. But but men, skinny men can lose their hair, right? It's rare you'll see a woman, a skinny woman with losing her hair. Right. And gray hair, we know. I know. I know my copper's low. I've had gray hair since I was 22. Well, estrogen is a growth hormone too, right? And uh, women naturally have very little testosterone. So I'm, I'm assuming that that has a lot, a lot, a lot to do with it. And I'm assuming that we actually don't want to do like estrogen treatment or something to get our hair back. That if we lose our hair, it's not the biggest deal in the world. Yeah. Cool. All right, man. I hope I hope people get a lot out of this recording. You know, you throw it up on your page. I'll throw it up on my page. Cut it up. Do what we got. You still got to put out Richard Renton part two. Oh, I know, man. I've been, You're I've been slacking a, a little bit. I, I stay busy, I promise. I'm never not working on something. Every day I'm working on something. But yeah, it's it slipped behind on my list a little bit. Oh, I, but you, this, you are right. You are 100% right. I got to put that out. But this this project you're working on with Dr. Wallach's classic book, Exotic Animals, that's a big project. So I commend you on that. I mean, that's a big book. That's massive project. Massive, massive. project. Massive. And it's, it's a thousand pages too. So did you I'm get a commission? Bugging. Obviously. Yes. And he's, he's actually bugging me about it. He's been calling me and bugging me and I've been bugging him for years about this years. I've been bugging him. Let's publish talk at the uh, disease of exotic animals again. He knew how big of a project it was, but once he finally signed on to it, literally a couple of months ago, I bought diseases of exotic animals. Cheapest I've ever seen. It was 900 bucks us over a thousand. It was over 1200 bucks. Canadian by the time by the time I got it. Most expensive book I've ever bought for sure. Wow. Uh, so yeah, he's been bugging me about that since. But it's a huge project. I can't publish it on Amazon because Amazon only allows 800 pages. I might publish it in chunks on Amazon if they let me. They might stop me because it is a copywritten work, even though WB Saunders is out of business. This is a, a you know, almost 40 year old book. Uh, it's it's actually it's turning it's turning 40 very soon. They might not let me publish it. I might have to go and, and drive down to Montreal and get it printed out myself in, as an actual textbook. And I'll probably still have to sell it for a hundred bucks, but it's better than a thousand. And that's again, the cheapest I've ever seen it because it's been out of print for so long. So I, none of us are, very few of us are gonna pay a thousand bucks for a book when it's regularly like six or 10,000. This is out of the question. And that's used, these are used copies. This is the, you know, this is the used price. My copy's a little bit beat up. It's not it's not a book, it's the book. No. Yeah. So that that uh, might be game changing. I'm also probably going to spend many years making YouTube videos about the individual studies that are in it because it's mm. it's loaded, man. I have it upstairs. I would I would hold it for you right now. I I, sm I I didn't smuggle it. I brought it back to Canada by hand so I didn't have an import fee, but like it's it's huge. It's like carrying a baby. <laughs> it's over, I think it's 6 pounds, you know. Is how many pounds? I think it's six pounds. Oh, Dr. Wallach, man. That book is a game changer. Yep. That changes everything. That and Dr. Price's book. Those are the two books I feel are like. Well, they cut down Dr. Price's uh, uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. They, they, I know they cut it way down to make it publicly accessible. That book could have been huge. And he actually has other books, by the way, that are hard to get, hard to find that have a lot more documentation about his, his teeth work too. So actually Dr. Price, Weston Price has a Bible that is not nutrition and physical degeneration. 
if you think physical degeneration is the is his most impressive thing you'll be blown away when you see the other one i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head i've only seen it in real life once uh, i'll probably also have to pay a thousand bucks to get a copy of that <laughs> all right man uh, this is fun <laughs>